a lot of the folks that have been around forever like me remember those days, but the new folks coming in, they see a different approach and they are anxious to co-create with us a community-based approach to serving in all sorts of new and innovative ways because of the technologies, because of you know what we saw with the pandemic. Um, we tried certain things out before the pandemic and now after the pandemic, we aren't touching it at all. For example, digital learning. You know, that was all the rage before the pandemic. Now you get these kids in front of a Zoom meeting or you get them in front of a WebEx for more than, you know, five minutes, forget it. I mean, it's, it's traumatizing. And so think about that. And that's what our group tries to do is we try and be very nimble and reactive to um, the needs of our audiences and communities around the, around the country. This is just a brag chart. So we call it the science activation across the nation. And so we have what we call these reach maps. And these are interactive maps. It's um, Esri maps for those of you that use that tool. And so when you go to the, lear the learner's homepage, um, we have a rotator and you can just click on and really just dive deep in your local area. In fact, I think uh, North Carolina Space Grant was gonna come in and, and uh, yeah, so you can go into the reach map and you can um, uh, click on all the areas that we touch in North Carolina. And the whole idea is to, you know, connect with them locally and create this ecosystem. And that's what this whole network of networks model is about that we've created. And so in 2019, we had um, surprisingly about 19 million people across the country. Um, and we know this by zip code, but then when the pandemic hit, it was even more so because people were looking for trusted resources without ads, I will add. Um, and so our numbers went up to 22 million and we have 113 nations that we reach, including the US, not trivial. So um, we just had a, a PI meeting with some of our new awardees and so while this says uh, 43 teams, we actually are funding um, in FY22 uh, 50 teams, and we have 268 partners that we do our work in these communities, like the American Library Association, like the Museum Alliance, like the um, planetarium group. So it's not that NASA feels like we have to do everything and control everything like the old model. We partner with those and then we enable through our content, our experts, our inspiration, and our authentic experiences. Here's a big picture that I've talked about a, a bit. Um, our model was a 10-year model because we wanted to build those relationships and that trust. We started in the 2016 timeframe and um, we were doing pretty good. And then the 2017 eclipse happened. And because of what we had already put in place, we helped enable 88% of the US adult population participated in the 2017 total eclipse. Did anyone not participate in the eclipse in the room? <laughs> And if you still have those glasses, um, they're good if they're not scratched for the 2023-2024 um, eclipses coming up, which will be in a school year, by the way. And I have a chart on that. So we also try and have um, a roses element when we want to really highlight uh, certain things like um, this last year, uh, the social inequities and injustice we were trying to combat. And so we have some awards that are uh, dependent on the 2022 budget, which hasn't been enacted yet. But when that is enacted, uh, after the continuing resolution lets up on December 3rd, um, we hope to announce some additional awards and that'll take us almost to 60 teams in science activation, funded at 56 million a year. So here's our science division leads. I'd like to personally shout out. Egley has been phenomenal. Uh, stepped right in. She was voluntold um, early on and she has just been so, I mean, you know, generous with her time and her energy 
And um, not only does she manage the existing gene labs and um, Joya's efforts and others, but she also has helped us do some of the panel evaluations on the new awards that I mentioned. And so, again, if we get that, or when we get that FY22 um, augmentation, you'll see a new award for um, BPS related material in there because we had the vision and the foresight to put it in roses this last summer. So we're excited about expanding our portfolio to include all of y'all and more in the future. Okay, this is just kind of a relationship model just to show that we do have a structure at headquarters representing the five lines of business, if you will, the five science disciplines of which BPS is one, biological physical sciences. And then it just shows kind of how we do the work, which is that those assets to audiences and the transformation in between or what we call dissemination. And so we have all sorts of different groups that we try and do. Why? Because we're K to gray, learners of all ages, and that is our very big charge. We're trying to advance the active participation of knowledge for learners of all ages. And we have that big vision. And so when we do that, you know, we look for ways to have those connections with groups that are already established in communities so that we don't duplicate. Now that's different than other parts of NASA. Again, calling out Space Grant, which is more inward looking right now, where they try and have, you know, an undergraduate focus with the goal of having a pipeline back into STEM fields or back into uh, NASA and do internships accordingly. That is very important and it's simpatico with what we're doing, but it's not the same um, approach by design. And so we have more of a community base and so the rest of the agency has more inward aspect, inward focus aspect. Um, again, I've touched on a lot of this. It's just to show that over a third of our portfolio today uh, is in the uh, broadening participation, also known as diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And then after we get the um, augmentation, it'll be almost 40% uh, with a goal of 50% when the program, uh, phase two of the program ends in December 2025. This is just a snapshot of our reach, but if you go to there again, you can just deep dive and you can see how um, active we are across the entire nation. And that's by, you can search by discipline, you can search by audience. It's a really fun interactive map. One of the things that I really wanted to highlight is that we have a value-based um, approach to our collaborative model. And so most of you uh, may or may not be familiar with the NASA values. You may know that safety has been the number one value for many years, but the others um, are equally important. And uh, Jim Bridenstine um, added the inclusion one um, before he left. And this was in response to a lot of the stuff going on in the country. Well. Science Activation had been doing a lot of that broadening participation inclusionary work since we started in 2016. And so it was a great alignment right from the, right the um, get-go. But what we also found, especially during the pandemic, and we, we really instituted this in 2.0, which uh, began in 20, um, 2020, was you know some of the stuff that we saw our group doing, even though we knew each other, we weren't treating each other very well. And you know, sometimes when you're in these, you know, virtual meetings and you're watching the chat, and I'm like, you know, why are they saying that about this person? They know this person, you know? And so I was seeing some of this behavior that, you know, was um, acting out now we see in a lots of different other spaces, but we were not wanting to have that in our trusted space. So we established these group, these group norms and it's really helped. Um, the reciprocity is one that I oh, don't do very often. Um, you know, two teenagers, it's kind of tough. But um, the other one that 
I really love is the assumed positive intent. So many times, in fact, driving up here from DC, you know, as you're being cut off, uh, you know, assume positive intent, you know, they're, they're late and so that's okay. But anyway, so I just wanted to share this with you because this is how we, uh, what informs our decision-making process. And certainly, you know, when we decide our annual meeting, which is normally, you know, everybody looks forward to that. It's in November of every year. This year we decided to go again, 100% virtual because of the safety, the number one. And um, we had to make this decision late summer and um, it was a very difficult decision, but the numbers weren't going down then. And so the fact that I'm here with you in 3D is so exciting because, you know, we aren't gonna do that in our, in our other program. Okay, and this is just a, um, Joy, are they going to see these charts? Do they get a copy of these charts? Um, it's Broadcast and recorded, yeah. So these charts are fully available for you all if you want them. Um, but this is our model and this is how we apply it. It's a collaborative model. Uh, Rafi Santos has helped us uh, do training on two or three workshops and occasions. And again, it's just another example of how we model this collaborative approach for collective impact across our network of networks. And then this is again, um, I've mentioned it about the ROSES 21. Um, ROSES, if you don't know that, there's a big omnibus solicitation. It comes out every uh, February 14th, hence the acronym ROSES, because you get ROSES on Valentine's Day happened way before my tenure, um, but that, and so 21 is the year in which it's released. Um, and so again, we're just real excited uh, once the FY22 appropriation happens that we'll be able to announce um, our BPS award. And then here is the Promise Solar Eclipse chart. We have an annular eclipse that's gonna be right around the Albuquerque, New Mexico Balloon Festival. Spaces are filling up fast, so please, uh, you know, I, if you're if you're going to be in that area, uh, you can imagine. Um, and then the other one will be April 8th in 2024, and this is a total eclipse, and it will have more totality than we had in 2017. So both of these are happening during the school year. So we're doing a lot of prep work already, and uh, we're going to leverage all the work, great work that we did in 2017. Now this is fun resources. I'm going to blow through this really quickly. And this is again all for your, um, uh, really your use. Um, so how many know that we have this big, huge uh, mission coming up? The James Webb Space Telescope is launching on December 18th from Karoo. Uh, everything is all systems go. This is, um, you know, a $10 billion mission. It's been going on for 20 years. It is a big deal event. And so what we are doing is we have established almost 500 community event sites learning from the Total Eclipse um, activities. And I will share with you what happened with the Total Eclipse is that, you know, it was along the path, we had this amazing engagement, history making, and then we were done. We went home, we're exhausted, you know, but the communities are like, what do we do next? What can we learn more, you know? And so we learned from that. And so what we're doing with the community engagement sites is we're having, you know, first with the launch, we're gonna get feedback. How can we do better to have these established relationships? And then the first light images are next summer. So we're going to have probably more than 500 then, and we're going to be work we're already working with these 500 sites to say, how can we co-create together ways that NASA can serve you in your community? So it's a whole different approach to what we've done before. So I encourage you to go to this lower um, website. We're going to combine the two with the reach map after launch, the successful launch, you know, we're all thinking positively. But I just wanted to give you a backstory on what the philosophy is about the community engagement sites. This is some fun swag. So um, the 3D print um, model is what the Hawaii group are doing as part of their engagement activities with their school kids. I love it. 
I'm not going to go into this because my colleague Mark Kushner is talking about this. I'm just going to blow through these really quickly. They're all highlighted with these free resources in Finiscope out of um, Arizona State University. It's a virtual world. The Globe Observers, for those of you that know the Globe program, it's been around for over 20 years. It's award-winning. The app is what we fund, and this has expanded the reach even further. So when you go out and you see these really cool clouds, you can use your phone to tag the clouds and upload the uh, data. Just one of them. Visualization Studio, there's over 8,000 visualizations at the SVS that you can peruse. It's really beautiful work, and it's all real data. Open Space is a planetarium-based uh, web-based on your computer so kids can actually do their own planetarium shows now. And this is with our friends at the American Museum of Natural History. NASA Eyes, this is our JPL folks, and there's a whole portfolio. It's eyes on solar system, eyes on Earth, eyes on exoplanets, eyes on asteroids, because we have the upcoming DART mission coming up. And so there's a lot of really fun things and you can do comparative sizes like a, you know, a school bus to a planetary object. So a lot of fun. My last heart is NASA Trex. And so this is another really exciting real data. We uh, work with um, our friends in the human side of the house. And this was originally an engineering tool. And it's now also used as an engagement tool. So when you go to Trex, you can go to an object like any surface object like Bennu or Moon or Mars or Vesta, Phobos, um, and you get to just literally play around the surface. And what I love about the first one we did, which was Moon Trex, someone mentioned the Constellation program where there was a um, prospector mission that this started from, Lunar Prospector, that never got um, off the ground, but the tool lives on. And so what I have over here is, and you can do this with any surface, through Trex, is you can draw a portion of the surface object, and then you can send it to your 3D printer. So for those of you that may have worked with Mike Wargo, a dear friend of ours um, in a um, couple of different organizations, um, there's a Wargo crater on the moon. And so I have a 3D printout of the Wargo crater. And so it's these kind of things, you know, another one was made, some reference to the Shackleton crater and things like that. So I encourage you to go to Trex if you have a 3D printer, play around, and you can print out your favorite um, surface object. And I think that is it. So with that, I will turn it back over to Joya. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to re-welcome you instead to the engagement plenary. Thank you for clarifying that. We're not the education plenary. Um, our next speaker speaking about SMD citizen science program is Dr. Mark Kushner. He's the citizen science officer for SMD um, and looking after 24 citizen science projects that connect more than 1.5 million volunteer scientists around the world. Um, Mark's an astrophysicist, and he began his work on citizen science as the PI of the Disk Detective Project and the Backyard Worlds Planet Nine Project, which discovered the Peter Pan disk phenomenon, the first extreme T subdwarfs, and most of the known ultra cool brown dwarfs, and run the Robert H. Goddard Award for Scientific Achievement. He also wrote a really useful book for the students in the audience, especially called Marketing for Scientists. Um, so. Please also text your questions to the same text please um, chain, the 855-855-1413, and we'll hopefully have a little time for them at the end. So Mark, come ahead. So greens forward, reds back, laser pointers. Oh, stand forward. How did you know all that stuff about me, Joy? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm going to perpetually keep trying to put things in chat and uh, move your faces around and uh, but it's not going to work because here you are in person. I'm the citizen science officer in, science mission, in the science mission directorate, and I, just like Kristen, who's my boss, 
I'm also super excited that uh, the uh, biological and uh, physical sciences division is joining us and is doing citizen science. And I'm going to tell you all about the citizen science we do. And I'm going to invite you to think about ways that you could do science together with, you know, say 100, 100,000 friends. NASA's citizen science projects are science projects that rely on volunteers. Uh, there are many different definitions for the word citizen science that you'll hear out there, but since what we do in the science mission directorate is science, we keep it simple. It just means that we have citizen science, that just means science that we do with volunteers. And of course, thanks to the internet, there's been a huge boom in this over the last couple of decades, and we can now do science with teams of hundreds of thousands of people. One great example of this is the Growing Beyond Earth project. I guess you've heard of it. Uh, so uh, Growing Beyond Earth project uh, reaches about 30,000 citizen scientists in about 250 schools around the country. And on the left, you can see one of the uh, sixth graders involved in the project who is experimenting with seedlings that could be grown in space. And on the right is one of the seedlings selected by the project actually being grown on the International Space Station. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about is real science really being done by real people all around the world. So citizen scientists, some of them look like as a sixth grader and some of them look like uh, Augusto. Augusto Ardizone is a retired architect who discovered one of the first known interstellar grains uh, on the Stardust at Home project. He lives in Palermo, Italy. So citizen scientists come in all uh, shapes and sizes and colors, and by the way, education levels. Uh, when I first started doing citizen science, I first imagined that there'd be people who would be, you know, um, maybe they'd be children, maybe they would be uh, just sort of dabbling, coming and, and clicking on a few things and then leaving. But the crazy thing that uh, that's gotten me completely hooked on citizen science is the incredible passion and intellectual energy of the citizen scientists themselves. We have reached now more than uh, 2 million volunteers. About 140,000 have advanced degrees. So think of these folks as bringing new skills, new talent uh, that NASA doesn't have access to, right? People come in, they are uh, lawyers, they are data scientists, they are artists. We have people who have contributed uh, abundant original artwork. Uh, they have abilities. Some of them are scientists from other fields who on the week, they did biology all week, and on the weekend, they want to do some geology. So they dabble in geology with us. 191 of these are now named co-authors on scientific papers, thanks to their work in the real science that we're doing at Citizen Science. Yeah. I used to say that, I used to brag that it was possible to do science as citizen science. And now I brag that we own multiple scientific fields. So NASA citizen scientists have discovered most of the known comets. There's no period there, but there should be because there are no other qualifiers there. It's not most of the blue comets, not most of the comets that are the nearest purple comets to, uh, no. Most of the known comets, all the known samples of interstellar material, half of the ultra cool brown dwarfs, nearly half of the long period exoplanets. I'll let you read the slide, to my slide yourselves. Nah, I won't. I'm going to sing it. The, fir <laughs> the first extreme T sub dwarfs, Zika virus, improving in sedimentary bases, the oldest white dwarf to breed this, the Drift Star phenomenon, the Peter Pan phenomenon, star forming regions called the Yellow Balls, 400,000 marginal seasonal fans, 283,000 emperor penguin nests, 8,900 mosquito breeding sites, seven meteorites, <laughs> and one new kind of aurora, not just like an aurora a new kind of aurora named Steve. <laughs> so how do we do it? 
Uh, one of the secrets is that we tap existing communities. And there are all these great communities of people who are already out there working on science, amateurs, uh, that would just love a little guidance from one of you guys, from, from, from one of us, about, hey, here's an experiment we need your help with. Here's a project we need your help with. They love, they're just sitting there waiting to, to be taught and to be included, right? So um, one of them that I want to point you guys to is the DIY biology community. There are all these clubs, DIY biology clubs all around. And wow, wouldn't it be great if they were all working for us? That's the kind of thing that we're doing. Another important group is there are folks who haven't maybe had the opportunity yet to really picture themselves as scientists. And we can help when you join the Citizen Science Project, you are doing real science that day. You go to sleep that night going, I did real, genuine science. What does a scientist look like? It looks like me. So we picture often citizen science as a tool for opening the doors of science as widely as possible. All right, so now you are all asking yourselves, how can I get involved? How can I join this uh, growing movement? So here's one opportunity for you. The Citizen Science Seed Funding Program, which I have to thank EGLA for, um, for has new, um, new biological and physical sciences component. This seed funding program is in our second year, and the goal is to help new projects get off the ground. So if you have an inkling of an idea, it's just a six-page proposal. It's meant to make the, the path uh, short. Six-page proposal, they're due January 21st. You get one year of funding, uh, and it gets you off on your way. It's for projects that are newly uh, new projects, for incubating new projects, and for helping projects do transitions. And this brings me to the second um, trick, second secret to citizen science, which is that I like to say that when there's big data, there's a need for citizen science. So if you're wondering, what, where can I get an idea for a citizen science project, take a look at wherever you're getting your big data from these days. And I know one, two key uh, big data repositories uh, that Eglitz pointed me to are the Gene Lab and the Physical Sciences Informatics Database. And that's what's going on in this year's uh, Citizen Science Seed Funding Program opportunity in the BPS division. Over and over again, the pattern that we see is that uh, folks will do the best job that they can with automated systems, with computers, looking at their big data, and the computer gets it right 99% of the time, right? You use your machine learning algorithm, your AI, whatever technique you have to crunch through the data, it does a bang up job, which is 99% accurate, right? And then that leaves 1% of stuff left, and of course, the machine did what you asked it to do. So the actual new discoveries to made that you didn't already know about are in that 1%. So you come to the citizen scientists and the humans to get um, the, the good stuff. What could you accomplish with help from 10,000 people? Come join our community and find out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Oh. One more thing, we have an ongoing workshop series going on right now, alternate Thursdays, uh, 3.30s. Uh, learn best practices in citizen science from colleagues. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mark. That, that was really great. And, and, you know, I echo what you're saying. If you get an army of researchers, you can do so much more. I mean, you've seen many talks here already where, you know, you have undergraduates toiling to measure things or count statoliths in cells or, or whatever, you know. What if you could outsource that to the, the, the global community and get a lot more out of it? So, um, 
So our last speaker is my co-organizer for this session, um, Egle Cecana Vichuti. Uh, she is uh, Dr. Egle Cecana Vichuti is the point of contact for science activation and citizen science for biological and physical sciences division, as, as you heard, and also the course director of the NASA STAR program. Um, she's also a scientist at the Space Biosciences Research Branch at NASA Ames Research Center and is the principal investigator in the Radiation Biophysics Lab where she studies the effect of deep space radiation on the nervous system and the immune system. And she also serves on our Education and Outreach Committee with ASGSR. And today she's going to be talking about our science activation activities in BPS. Excellent. Thank you, Joya, for this wonderful introduction. So I will give you a very short overview with a few examples on science activation and citizen science activities at BPS. So the general mission of the BPS division is pioneering scientific discovery and enabling spaceflight exploration. As you know, it includes space biology program and physical sciences program, and they are both concerned with experiments with research done in spaceflight. Using both multiple um, uh, locations in space as well as ground analogs. So let's start talking about the science outreach um, and citizen science programs at BPS with some experimental hands-on programs. I would like to uh, use two examples. The first one is the wonderful Growing Beyond Earth program that of course Mark also mentioned because it is a huge program. There are 250 schools around the continental US and in Puerto Rico are um, testing different plant varieties and different ways to grow plants on the International Space Station, and they have sent and successfully grown two of them there already. Another example I would like to bring up is the Glenn Research Center Drop Tower Challenge, which is a challenge for the high school students to design and engineer projects that then later can be tested in microgravity. So these are both quite unique experimental um, outreach opportunities. In addition, there are a lot of opportunities that involve data and more possibilities of virtual and say bioinformatics related work. So first of them is a very fun one that is actually just finishing right now. That is the big NASA Space Apps Challenge, which included this year almost 30,000 participants from 162 countries and territories. And for the first time, BPS participated in it with two teams that were attracted a great deal of participants. The Have Seeds Will Travel, again, marvelously run by KSC folks, uh, was um, about uh, plant growth in space. And the Trail to Mars was a team I was involved in with, um, at NASA Ames Research Center and was about creating a game that uh, simulates um, long duration space travel. And uh, both of these attracted more than um, 200 teams each. In addition, as you have heard, BPS is very, very keen on doing open science and sharing all the results with the public. There are multiple sessions at this conference specifically focused on open science. And of course, we have the Gene Lab, which is the open access repository of uh, all space biology omics data. And Gene Lab has both analysis working groups for more professional scientists who want to reanalyze the data and create and generate new results and publish new papers, which they have been doing copiously over the last few years. Also, Gene Lab for You pilot program for teaching undergraduates bioinformatics using that space biology data repository and Gene Lab for High School program for teaching high school students about bioinformatics and space biology and critical thinking and scientific thinking. The physical sciences counterpart to Gene Lab is the PSI, which is Physical Sciences and Informatics Database. And also there are other uh, sample and uh, data archives, um, both uh, the Bio Biosciences Scientific Collection and NASA Ames Life Sciences Data Archive, which have a non-omics data, but other types of data, for example, images. 
Now, all of these databases are a treasure trove for new citizen science projects. And I would like to echo Mark that we have the citizen science seed funding opportunity open right now for proposing projects on a, using GLAB or PSI data for citizen science. So if you have any ideas about them, contact me or Mark. And it, the, uh, the, this open data has already been used in some challenges, such as the Frontier Development Lab challenge, which is uh, using artificial intelligence to answer NASA important questions, such as, for example, this year to uh, model radiation mediated damage to uh, astronauts. Now, what I've been mentioning is mostly uh, opportunities for learners sort of outside of NASA. We also have multiple training opportunities for learners who are more directly involved in NASA, either coming in or virtually. And that covers all ages, starting with high schools, as I mentioned, uh, Gene Lab for High School program, which um, attracts not only high school students, but also selects some high school teachers who then can incorporate uh, Gene Lab into their curriculum. Going on with undergraduates, NASA Ames has the SLSCP or the Space Life Sciences Training Program, and I met quite a lot of undergrads involved in this program here at the conference. There are regular NASA internships that BPS is part of, as well as NASA international internships that BPS is also part of. There is the EPSCOR program for undergraduates and graduate students from selected states with a less uh, uh, science uh, uh, and science education funding, as well as minority university um, program for uh, undergraduates and graduate students as well. And there's one new one coming up, not out yet, but will be out soon, which is uh, funding for graduate students in uh, bio space biology and physical sciences related disciplines. So keep your eyes on Inspires for this upcoming solicitation. Once you're going past the students in universities, there are training opportunities for uh, post back students um, through one of our contractors, as well as uh, for postdoctoral scholars. And finally, there is the STAR program um, that was also mentioned before for uh, principal investigators, senior postdocs and senior researchers who are interested in space biology and doing experiments in space, but they don't know how. So we aim to teach them about it. And that is one of the programs on which I am the, one of the organizers and um, the course director. So I'm particularly um, delighted by it. Um, now, in addition to um, um, listing all these programs as an invitation to check them out and see if you would like to be involved, I know that quite a lot of you have been involved in one of them. And I would like to encourage you to then go out and get uh, involved in some outreach activities to sort of spread the word and spread the good fortune of um, having had a chance to learn about NASA science. Now, finally, since we were talking about the general science activation, and also since BPS is very, very fortunate to be now included in this huge umbrella of SMD sponsored science activation programs, I wanted to use as an example, one way in which we are directly going to be working with one of the science activation sponsored groups, which is the SCOPE program, which is basically establishing a community of science and um, gathering subject matter experts, which can be from academia or from NASA or from elsewhere, and uh, connecting them with uh, SIACT funded programs, so those outreach programs. And also providing training for subject matter experts, because not all of us are born knowing how to do outreach. And finally, funding small outreach opportunities. So this is not out yet, but will be out presumably in February. Again, keep your eye out for um, the NASA scope um, upcoming funding opportunities. And this program was created for all of SMD and now is including biological and physical sciences scientists as well. The general future directions are focused on promoting the inclusion of uh, everyone 
especially members of historically underrepresented groups in science, as well as um, facilitating the access of non-specialists to all this wonderful open data that we have. And of course, expanding existing, creating new outreach program, projects, and specifically focusing on incorporating virtual content, which sometimes does allow us to reach much broader audiences of learners. Uh, for example, we were able to open STAR course to international learners uh, because we're running it virtually this year. And I would like to uh, finish with a shout out to the education session tomorrow afternoon. Please consider attending it. And finally, this is my email for any questions or um, any interest in being involved in one of our projects. And thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Aglai. That was a wonderful overview. Um, please text questions. We've got about 10 minutes for questions or so. So please text your questions to 855-855-1413. And we do have a questions for the panel to start. So um, the first one is, I guess we'll start with Kristen and then and maybe Mark, you can also comment. What is your biggest challenge in, in your outreach programs? Mm. <clears throat> I think is it already on? Yeah. I think the biggest challenge is really to, um, you know, think through what is the biggest risk. And in my mind, it's preserving the trust that is kind of the contract with the public that we enjoy. And a lot of times now, uh, folks really don't trust a lot of our institutions. And so for me, I think the biggest challenge is to make sure that we connect our audiences with our trusted um, subject matter experts or leaders, folks that look like the audiences we're trying to reach, and to maintain that trust that we've enjoyed and maybe taken a bit for granted, because it is such a fragile, fragile thing um, and once broken, you just, it's, I don't know if you can ever get it back. So that's the kind of stuff that I think about as the biggest challenge. Yes, on a, on a lighter note, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, on a lighter note, a big challenge is keeping up with all the enthusiasm, keeping up with the interest, keeping up with the emails. I um, don't have a great way yet to handle 200,000 enthusiastic people who, who pepper us with questions. <laughs> it's, it's a good kind of problem to have, mm -hmm. but, but I, I guess another way to phrase it is stretching, you know, a handful of SMEs to um, work with, um, you know, scale to a uh, millions of citizen scientists is, that's, that's the next step we have to figure out how to do better. No, I, I I agree. I think we might need a, a citizen science ambassador program made up of other citizen scientists who help, can help Mark answer his emails. Um, <laughs> okay, this is a question for Egle, and we got it actually twice. Um, can you explain more about the Gene Lab for universities and where can people find out more about it and when will it be offered, et cetera? Excellent. So the GMAP for Universities program was just run this year as a pilot program with San Jose State University to great results. And um, all the um, data that was used for the training and the lectures are actually on GitHub. And if I was giving this uh, talk online, I would be able to send you a link. Um, so if you email me, I will send you a link, but you can also look for a Gene Lab on uh, NASA GitHub and then click uh, down to find it there. And uh, I can also uh, set you up with the organizers of this program if you are interested in expanding it specifically to, for example, your university. Great. Um, and the NASA SCOPE program, will that be available on ROSES? Uh, right, so NASA SCOPE program, I don't think it will be on ROSES. I think, I think that will be led by the program itself. So right now it does have a website that um, is on my chart, and I think the charts are recorded and available online. So please go there, check it out. 
Um, and uh, then it will have the, both the funding opportunities and the list of subject matter experts where you can sign up to be matched with an outreach program. Or of course, if you're an outreach program, you can sign up to be matched with a subject matter expert. So follow that website. But once the opportunities are available, they will also be uh, distributed through hopefully SGSR mailing list because I'm going to send it there, um, AGU mailing list if anybody's involved in that and so on. Okay, great. Yeah. This, the scope program already exists, so it's already fully funded. It's already in existence. They spent the last uh, several months getting organized and, and uh, making sure that they're ready. Uh, and they'll be at these meetings in the future. And any future questions, just to contact Egley. Forward it to them, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's it's not going to be in roses. It's already existing. Okay. What next steps, and this is for any of the panelists, what next steps would you suggest for an undergraduate student who wants to pursue a career with a large science outreach component? Mm. It's a hard one. Well, I think what's concerning is that uh, what we're hearing is that a lot of folks that have this energy don't get rewarded in the system for, do yeah, so you see the heads going up and down. That's what we're trying to remedy um, because science isn't done until it's shared. It's the last step in the process. So why when these folks are really good at sharing the science, they get almost penalized for it? makes no sense. So this is something that we um, have talked about deeply in science activation. We'll probably have a workshop on it to address because it is first of uh, top of mind and uh, welcome anybody's you know personal opinions on this because in fact I think it was Michelle Thaler. Michelle Thaler got an astrophysics PhD so she could be a science communicator. <laughs> so yeah, and practice, practice, practice too, I think yes. is a big big part of it. Uh, this one's for Mark specifically. Um, you mentioned citizen scientists being involved in publications. Can citizen scientists also contribute to things like new technology reports and patents? I'm, I don't think I'm aware of a patent yet, but citizen scientists have showed up at uh, professional conferences, given presentations at the conferences, um, been taken part in proposals. One, um, we have citizen scientists who have one time on the James Webb Space Telescope, who have one time on Hubble. We have citizen scientists who have uh, built their own instruments and who have built their own radio telescopes, who have built their own uh, software tools and published the software tools. Um, any way that a that professional scientists are disseminating their, their results to their colleagues, citizen scientists are welcome to and are already doing pretty much. That's just awe-inspiring. Yeah. So. Um, there is a question about the upcoming graduate fellowship who will be eligible, will be masters as well as PhDs. Is, do we know about that yet? So I don't think we actually know about that yet, okay. um, but uh, wait, I think it's, uh, it's in one of the upcoming calls. So great, we'll be there. Okay, um, then there were a couple questions about, well, one, uh, do, do some of the education and outreach projects mention align with next gen science standards so that teachers can readily adopt these programs? Uh, yes, in fact, we have learning resources that go by discipline that have all the alignment on the learners page. And so we have these two amazing Einstein fellows and they've been taking on that challenge. And the BPS one, the biological is due when? This spring? Yeah, the BPS is uh, following, as yeah. always, since it's yeah. been US. Yeah, they just started doing that yeah. with Egley's help. And so look for biology uh, probably in February. So, and I think the uh, astrobiology, the astrophysics, heliophysics, those are already out. So everything we do is aligned with NGSS. Um, because I think it's 42 states now either adapt or have adopted NGSS. So we've invested in that. Thanks. Wonderful. And then I think yeah. the last question, because we need to wrap it up, um, and this one, Egla, you might take, you know, will the BPS decadal survey include content for science activation and citizen in science, science and how can people support this? 
oh, I am very happy to tell you that it will, because with Joya and with our uh, str outreach strategic working group at BPS, we have just submitted a fairly large outreach, uh, a fairly large, I mean, white paper to the National Academies. And there are other white papers that are specifically focused on uh, uh, involvement um, of students and uh, on of retention of uh, subject matter experts at NASA and uh, also on diversity. So, great. Thank you. And um, we did get a comment, a shout out for the Citizen Science Project, the participation in Growing Beyond Earth Maker Challenge helped me to get the courage to pursue a degree in plant biology with space biology focus. So Who thank you for that. that. Yeah. Stand up. That's pretty awesome. Who was it? Yeah, if, if whoever wrote that could raise their hand. Oh, Yay. that's go. awesome. Oh, that's amazing. So this concludes our excellent panel. Please thank all our speakers. And thank you for your great questions and your attention. And now the graduate poster session is next door. So please join me there.